So it's coming up pretty soon, but every four years there is a major race. Now, of course, people in the United States want to know who's going to win this race, but there's people all around the world that are curious who's going to win this race. Uh, it has implications globally. Uh, usually there's the, the front runner, the person everybody picks to win. Maybe there's that dark horse second place. And every once in a while you get that third wild card that kind of throws a wrinkle in things. But uh, there's a title going on with it. It's every four years. And I usually keep up with every person in the race. I want to know all the details. I want to know kind of what's going on. This year, I don't know the name of anybody in the race. Now, before you get worried about my mental state, I'm not talking about the political race, the presidential race. I'm actually talking about the Olympics. They're coming up in about two weeks. Now, some of you, that was a sigh of relief. You're worried about me. A, you're either worried he's about to go political on us. He's never done that in two years. Or B, he doesn't know who's running for president. Uh, no, but in the Olympics, there's a race. Those men run that 100 meters and the winner of that gets a title, fastest man in the world. Now, I don't know who won the 2023 world title. I don't seem to care. But when the Olympics hits, like I want to know, I want to keep up with it. And it's coming up pretty soon. I'm curious, um, when you think about the Olympics, there's three big sections. I, I don't really watch most sports besides football and basketball and, and in baseball, but it's usually playoffs only for them. This is like playoffs for all kinds of stuff. I don't, but I do like to watch the Olympics. They share the stories of the people. They learned that a few years ago. If you tell the story, we care about these kids and see where they're coming out instead of just care, you know, caring about our, the, the country representation. So, you know, you got your big three. You got swimming, you've got gymnastics, and you got track and field. So if you're going to watch the Olympics, especially you kids, like if you had to pick one, which, which would be your favorite? Right? Show of hands if it's swimming is your favorite. That's the part you really like. There's the swimming and the diving. I know for the first week, swimming is all our favorite because it's the only thing I own for a little bit. So we all watch the swimming. And then you got gymnastics. What about gymnastics? Okay, I saw, I figured there'd be some. I know some of you take gymnastics as well. What about track and field? Anybody track and field? Now, there was a time when I was really into track and field. You think about Usain Bolt when he was doing that. I want, he was must-see TV. If we were to ask the Apostle Paul today what his favorite sport would be, I think he would pick track and field because when you look at his writings, the letters in the New Testament, what you find time and again is he writes using uh, athletic imagery. He talks about the crown, uh, the wreath. He talks about uh, the running the race. And he also talks about military uh, str strategic kind of information like in Ephesians he says we do not wrestle against flesh and blood that could be athletics like wrestling and a, a gladiator or Greco-Roman wrestling but more likely it was military for close quarters combat so he uses that illustration and he uses a lot about this idea of running the race when you think about running the race like if you looked at the at the Bible like the 100 meters there's somebody who's going to get the title the greatest of all time, or the fastest in the world. If you were to say, who's the greatest in the New Testament, apart from Jesus, that doesn't count. I'm talking about the followers of Jesus. Who would be the greatest? I couldn't argue with you if you said the Apostle Paul, because we just see so much of what he did. Yes, he started off as a persecutor of the church, but by the end, he was the greatest missionary for those of us who became followers of Jesus later on, especially that were not Jewish. But if you ask Paul who's the greatest, he'd say, I'm still in the race. I, he's inviting us into the race today, and, and he actually gives us some, some, some writings. If you're a follower of Jesus today, then you're in the race. And he tells us that until you die, you're still in the race and to finish well. And he gives us some tips on that of like, how is he going to finish well in his life? How does he finish strong? And so today, I, I'd like to talk with you about that from Philippians chapter 3. Going out of order a little bit, we'll come back to the first 11 verses next week. But I just wanted to take some time this week uh, with these, unpack them with you for just a minute. Philippians 3, starting in verse 12, we're going to look at verses 12 through 16, primarily 12 through 14 in this. Paul is going to talk about this idea of a race. If you're just joining us, we've been in Philippians for the last couple of weeks. The letter Philippians was written as a thank you note and an encouragement from the Apostle Paul. You see, the Apostle Paul was in prison. Didn't know if he was going to get out or not. He was under house arrest in Rome. And Philippi, the church there, hears about it, sends a love offering. And as a result, he, 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 he writes him a thank you letter and an encouragement. Now, here's the number one theme of Philippians. The theme is joy. 
And this is a guy who's chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. There is no privacy. Every six hours, there's a new shift and a new person is watching over him. How can that be a place where you can write about joy unless joy isn't based on our circumstances? And there's nothing wrong with happiness and wanting to be happy, but happiness is based on our circumstances. Joy is about knowing who we are in Christ. Joy allows us to rise up in spite of our circumstances, to over, uh, overcome those things that we face. And so that's what Paul was writing to them about. And so he's giving them advice that their citizenship is, is in heaven, uh, that they're just, uh, it's not just about their citizenship here on the earth. And so uh, we start to pick up in verse 12. Uh, he's just told them about his pedigree. He's like, look, I was if you, if you want to like brag about things, I, he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Pharisee, which is the religious of the religious elite. He says, as to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. When it came to righteousness, he had followed all the law. He says, but I count all that as rubbish or garbage for the sake of knowing Christ and knowing the power of his resurrection, sharing in his sufferings. That's all verses 1 through 11. He talks about that. Now we pick up just inside of that saying, now I've not arrived to this. I'm still in the race. Look at what he says in verse 12. Not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. He's saying, I have not already arrived at this. I've not finished the race. I'm still trying to Press on. The word press here is used multiple times in the Bible for persecution. It's the idea of intense pursuit. There would be people like Paul before he became a follower of Christ that was pursuing Christians. It was an intense pursuit after one thing. That's from the negative perspective. Now he's saying, I press on to this. What is this? It is to know Jesus, to be more like him, to meet him on that day when I die, I will be with him in the air. Those are the kinds of things that Paul is writing about here. He says, I'm not already perfect. He needed to explain that to them because they probably thought, well, I could never get to where he's at. I can never attain what the apostle Paul, he's perfect, I'm not. And so we settle in as followers of Christ. A lot of times we settle into, okay, we become a follower of Christ. We know we're going to heaven when we die. We're never going to be perfect like Jesus. So Why would I strive to be way up here when this is just good enough? As if that's how Christ calls us into the kingdom. The more we understand what Jesus did for us, the fact that Jesus died on the cross to set you free from that sin you still struggle with, when you begin to grasp that, when you begin to attain that like the apostle Paul did, you want to strive toward more. That's why he's saying, I have not already attained these things. Um, when When you get into it right here, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Why does he pursue this? Because Christ pursued him first. He recognized when he was on that Damascus road and he encountered Jesus, everything changed for him. And instead of being thrown away, he receives grace. And when you you read through Paul's writings, he understands that I was saved by grace through faith. Not of myself, it's a gift of God. So the first question when we talk about this idea of a race is this. When did you start the race? We're going to talk about racing. When did we start the race? I didn't say, when did you start going to church? I didn't say, when did you get baptized? I'm talking about by grace through faith, when did you realize that you needed Jesus as your Savior, that he died on the cross for your sin, and it's not what you do, but what Christ did, and you're placing your faith in him, that's when you start the race. And I will tell you right now, if you've never started the race, I'm going to invite you to do that in just a few minutes. I'm going to be up here at the front, and after I pray, I'm going to invite you to make that decision. So I invite you to consider that now. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, and you know whether or not you have, you know if you're in the race, I'm going to invite you to do that today. But now that you've gotten in the race, let's talk about the starting of the race, the finishing of the race, and all these things. What we see here is he says, I press on. He's going to say that twice. He says it in verse 12, but he's going to go on and say it again in just a minute. But this idea of press on, I press on to make it my own. I press on, he says, to obtain it. Uh, I press on toward the goal, verse 14. It's this idea of single-minded focus. And he gives us what that focus looks like. So here we go, picking up. And um, when you look at his life, this is, he says, I've not arrived. I've not finished. He doesn't know if he's going to live or die. He's, He's actually written about that in this letter. He's like, I don't know which is better because if I die, I get to be with Jesus. But if I live, I'm going to stay and I get to love on you more. 
but I'm torn because I really want to be with Jesus. Like he was fine either way to me to live as Christ and to die as gain, he said. But at the end of his life, he knew. It was years later, and he writes to Timothy, and he tells him this. Think about this idea of finishing the race. We want to get advice from a guy like this. He says this in 1 Timothy. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. That's who I want to listen to. You know, when I get people giving me advice, like fitness advice, and they're 20, I'm sorry, your metabolism and mine do not compute. I gave people advice in my 20s too, you know? Like, I learned a lot since then, okay? But, like, uh, I want to get advice from people that seem to have understood what they're talking about. Paul, he understood it. I fought the good fight. He could write that because he had lived it. I finished the race. And here's what he says in verse 8. And because of this, henceforth, there is now laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord on that day, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to those who have loved his appearing. He says, I see where the victory comes. It's when I get to be with Jesus. But he's telling us today, he's not finished the race. And if you're not dead, then you're not finished either. And so he tells us how to keep our eyes on the important things. Verse 13, he says it this way. "Um, Brothers, I do not consider to have made it my own. He has not arrived yet. I'm still in the race, he says. But one thing I do. He's going to tell us one thing and then tell us how he does it two ways, okay? It's a little confusing. One thing I do, he says, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. Here's the one thing. That's just describing what he's doing. I press on toward the goal. For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on. Singularly focused, intense pursuit toward Jesus. Everything else compared to that does not matter. Um, You know, this is where we get into that idea of like, are you hungry for Jesus? I had a, it was a motivational coach and he's like trying to help kids that wanted to go to the next level in sports. And he says, do you love uh, sleep more than you love football? Because that's going to define whether or not you get up and get the practice done or whatever. You're choosing what you love more. And so when you think about it from our perspective on this, you know, are you as hungry for Jesus as you are for, I don't know, social media? Are you as hungry for Jesus as you are for recognition at work? Are you as hungry for Jesus as, biblical, uh, uh, as, as you need for biblical community? Are you recognized as a great parent? Is that what you chase? We all have a focus. We're all chasing something. The question is, are we putting our eyes on the right thing? Paul wants to help us understand that upward prize. What does he look like? And so there's two parts to this that he does. He says, that, go back to verse 13. He says, I do this. One thing, forgetting the past forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. So that's the two things. But he says it's one thing. One thing I do. This is the priority. This is everything in his mind, okay? This is what should be at our priority. What is the one thing in your life? Is it sports? Is it recognition? Is it your kids? Or is it Jesus? And we all have to answer that for ourselves. And some of us are going to settle for less than best today. And I hope you don't. You're going to say, I'm, I'm kind of satisfied. But you're missing out on the joy that comes from knowing Jesus fully, that Paul says was worth everything else. So this one thing, there's some times where this happens in, in life. The one thing for him is to be like Jesus. There's other times he mentions the one thing Jesus does. Uh, for instance, uh, when you start looking through this, there's one in Luke's gospel, Luke chapter 10. Mary and Martha are getting ready, and Jesus shows up. He arrives at the house. Mary sits at Jesus' feet. Martha, she's in the kitchen. She's banging pots and pans. She's trying to get everything ready, and she gets frustrated. I know you've never seen this. I know you've never felt it. But she comes in there, and she's frustrated at Jesus. Jesus, won't you tell her to help me? Don't you see what I'm doing? I'm slaving in this kitchen for you, Jesus. Mary, come help me. That's basically what she says. That's my paraphrase. But the Lord answered her this way in verse 41. He said, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. How many of us could be described that way? We're anxious and troubled about many things. He says this, verse 42, but one thing. Here's the one thing. One thing is necessary. Mary's chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. He had cho- she had chosen to focus on the things, the, the words of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, and that was the one thing. What is your one thing? What do you focus on? What distracts you from Jesus? 
uh, in those moments. There's another option in Luke chapter 18. Again, a rich young ruler comes up to Jesus. And he says, what must I do to be saved? Which that begins, that starts it off on the wrong foot. What must I do? It's all about me, right? And he already knew his answer. He was expecting to get praise from Jesus. So Jesus talks to him about the law. And he says, all these things. I've kept all the law since I was a child. Luke 18, 22, when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. What's the one thing? For this man, it was to sell all that he had and distribute to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. He he called him to sell everything and follow Jesus. You see, his possessions owned him, not the other way around. He doesn't call every person that follows him to do the same thing. He knows their heart. And for this man, he knew what his one thing was. It was his possessions. For others, it might be hobbies. But for many of us, it's money, possessions, those kind of things. That's the thing. The idolatry we see in the Bible was always dealing with prosperity. Quick fixes and shortcuts that lead us to prosperity. And Jesus is calling us to more, that there's something better than this world can even offer. And some of us in this room, maybe you are a follower of Christ, but you're not sure you believe that anymore. Because you like the things of this world. He goes on. We're not going to finish it today. But he talks about that a little bit. How uh, they have taken their eyes off of, uh, of the spiritual things. And they've placed their eyes on earthly things. But we are called to be citizens of heaven. I'm not even going to have time to get into that today. I knew kids were going to be in the room. They're also singing three songs. Something had to give. So I'm not going to go 50 minutes this week. Just so you know. If I do, something went really wrong. Okay, because like I'm, I'm planning to, let's put it that way. We're 15 minutes in, we're doing fine. But I did want to take some time on this next part. And I'd love to have coffee with you about those other parts. If you're struggling with those things, yeah, Christ died on the cross for your sin. He didn't die on the cross for you to stay where you're at today, caught up in sin, struggling. He says in more, chapter 1, verse 6, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. He wants the best for you. When I raise up my kids, if I never let them get up so they learn how to walk, I'm not really being a good parent. I want want them to grow up. As much as I want them to stay babies so I can hold on to them forever, I need them to grow up. In the same way, some of us need to hear from Jesus, it's time to grow up. It's time to put away some things and focus on what is important. So here's how he says to do that. There's two things, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. How do we do that? Well, straining forward, we'll get to in a minute. That's that athletics. That's the idea of racing, every muscle firing, every arm. You know, the arms are pumping, legs are burning. But forgetting from, <laughs> forgetting what lies behind, what does that look like? Um, if you go back to the early part of chapter 3, you see his accolades. You see he was the religious elite and when they were bragging on their religious background, he says, look, I could brag more, but I count it all as, as trash. He's like, so there's two ways you can look at forgetting what lies behind. One is to not uh, rest on past failures because he realized that he had persecuted the church. He realized he had messed up. And there are some in this room right now, God's calling you to something. And you say, I can't be used by God. God can't use me like I see other people in the church because you don't know my past. You don't know what I did. And I know that Jesus is bigger than our failures. I know that when he calls you something, he's faithful to complete it. So if he calls you forgetting what lies behind, let's stop looking at our past failures. It seems to be more likely, though, for Paul, he says, forget your past successes. Stop resting on your laurels and say, well, you know, I used to help at church. I used to pray. I used to read my Bible. I used to have faith that moved mountains. This is not a relay race where you hand it off to the next generation. We're all in the race together. And you might be further along in the race than me or otherwise, but we're all in it together. And he even calls us to imitate one another. How are we going to do that if you're resting on your laurels? Because some of you are mountains in the faith, and I'm so thankful when I see you here faithfully at different times when no one else sees it, I see it. And this is not a push to get everybody signed up for VBS next year. That's not what this is, okay? We have great helpers, and God always takes care of us. But it's just like talking about giving. We don't talk about giving a lot. I've been a pastor for 20 years. I don't talk about giving a lot. If it's in the passage, I talk about it. You know what's nice right now? We're debt-free. 
When I talk about it, it's not because we're in need. It's because it's going to be an opportunity for you to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus in a way of discipleship. In the same way with service, we're not hurting right now. Uh, the, the church isn't going to fall in if we don't have one more volunteer. So this is not a big volunteer push Sunday. This is simply saying, if you want to follow Jesus, you know what? The things that you will pursue is his word. You'll, you'll pursue biblical community. Uh, you'll pursue ways to serve him using the gifts that he's given you. These are ways, the next steps for some of us that might need to happen. But we start with forgetting what lies behind. Stop forgetting you know, you forget about, oh, God can't use me because of this, the bad stuff. It's also, hey, I've tallied up enough. It's time. I'm just going to sit back and let somebody else do it. Until he calls you home, he's not done with us yet. Uh, but then he tells us to strain forward, straining forward to what lies ahead. Like an athlete straining forward in a race, what lies ahead, it says, you go all the way down to verse 21, he will transform our lowly bodies into his, like his glorious body, and we will be with him. That's why we strain forward, because he is worth it all. It's not so he will love us. Remember at the beginning, he says, I grab hold of this because Christ is grabbing hold of me. We love because he first loved us. None of this is about, I'm going to run this race so Jesus will love me. I run this race so I earn Jesus' love today. It doesn't work like that. You can't earn his love. That's why it's grace. It's the hardest thing in our culture. For some, it's, 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 it's wonderful to hear, nothing you do today is going to make God love you less. Let that wash over you for a second. There's nothing you do today that's going to make God love you any less. I think the harder one in an achievement-oriented society like ours is to hear there's nothing you can do today to make God love you more. We like the idea that he loves us more. The haves, the haves not are like, I can pray a little easier today because I lived the right life this week as if we're pleasing God through our actions versus our righteousness in him. I'm not saying that's easy. Paul's not saying it's easy. He says all the time, I've not arrived. He says, there's things I do that I don't want to do, and there's things I don't do that I should do. Oh, man of death that I am, who can save me from this body of death, he says, but thanks be to God, who Christ is my answer. What's your one thing? If it's anything other than Jesus, you're pointing in the wrong part of the race. You're, you know, you know, you've ever seen the people running one way and somebody get off track, you know, especially on those bike races? Well, they miss one of the turnoffs and they're just running. They're going the wrong way, right? Some of us are running full speed ahead at the wrong thing. Maybe it's a chance to turn around today and just respond. Um, I want to close with that. I'm going to give a chance for invitation in just a moment. But when you think about that one thing in your life, if, if someone was to describe that one thing for you, what would it be? We ask that same question. For me to live is Christ. That's what Paul would say. For me to live is what? Can you, can you say it's Christ today? And I remember I, I mentioned there's starting of the race, there's running a race, there's finishing a race. Let's finish well. But maybe you're here and you've never made that decision to follow Christ today. I want to give you that opportunity. I'm going to be right here at the front. I'm going to pray in just a moment. And when, if you want to do that or you've got questions, come to the front and say, I want to become a Christian. or I want to follow Christ. I'll know what you mean. And we'll start there on this journey. But don't miss the opportunity. There's so much. There's so many riches to be, to be grasped when we start to realize what Christ has already done for us. Will we pursue him today? Will you be in biblical community? Will you be in his word? Will you be a, a, a conduit of what he has already gifted you with? If you need help with any of those steps, come see me. I'd love to talk with you or get you connected. But let's not miss the opportunity to respond right now. Whatever God's speaking to you, maybe it's through the kids and, and the First Timothy 1.17 passage that they sang to us. Maybe it's through one of the songs or maybe it's through the teaching time. Whatever you need to do right now, we want to give you that freedom to respond, okay? So there's freedom here today. Some that'll be singing at the top of their lungs. You can stay quiet and bowed in prayer. No one's going to be judging to see who's, who's coming to the altar or not. We, don't, we cut a deal every week. We're not going to be talking about who comes to the altar and prays or doesn't because maybe they're praying for you for gossiping about them. That's my favorite joke, okay? So, the, you know, I remember going up Hey, who was that at the, at the altar this week? You know, we don't do that here. We just want you to have the freedom to do business with God. So let me pray for us and we'll continue. God, I thank you so much for how you love us. I thank you for each and every person in this room. I know it's not a coincidence that we're here today. And so I pray, Lord, for those that even right now you're calling to yourself. I pray that they would respond. Lord, I pray for those that have been in the race 
and just need to spend some time with you today and get, get realigned again. Lord, I pray that you'd help us all finish strong. Lord, you give us wisdom as a church to walk alongside these young, young people and the mature ones that have been running the race for many years. Lord, help us to imitate them and, and walk alongside them in a way that pleases you. Lord, I pray everything done here would give you glory and honor. That as we, as, we, as we lift up these songs, like Zephaniah says, that you would rejoice over us with singing as we bless your name. We ask it in the only name we know how, the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Would you come?